So in this series, there's Christophe van Herwey. Today, there's uh, Francois Charbonnet of Made in, uh, in a few weeks. Uh, there's um, Frances, uh, Fabricio Balabia, um, later on, on actually on uh, San Felice in, in, uh, in Napoli. And there is also Oliver Till who was here teaching last year. So you understand that we try to especially make the range as big as we can. Now, today is Christophe. He, as we know, has an obsession with 1989 and um, uh, the OMA of that time, but of course, uh, not only that. We suspect he might touch upon that, uh, since we are working in Paris, uh, very much the site of uh, 89 uh, OMA, not the only site, of course. Uh, we felt uh, he was specifically well placed um, to contextualize from his perspective. Thank you, Christophe. Thank you, Justin. Um, indeed, well, what I will do is, uh, in a way, quite simple, but also a bit experimental. Uh, I will just discuss very briefly three uh, texts, books, or articles by uh, Roland Barthes. You probably uh, all know he was a, a French writer and intellectual living in Paris, born in 1915. Uh, he died by a car accident in 1918. And I think that the interest, there is a very particular interest in uh, the writings of uh, Roland Barthes from the end of the 60s, because he, in these three texts, or in other texts as well, but uh, in these three texts in particular, he sort of defined uh, what you could call a metropolitan condition. And I think, uh, and this is partly uh, sort of uh, intuition, but it's also based on uh, other kind of, uh, you could say, historical evidence. I think that this kind of metropolitan, uh, or this conception of the metropolis by Roland Barthes has been very influential to the, uh, the ideas of uh, Rem Kolas and his Office for Metropolitan Architecture. So in a way you could say that although OMA, uh, of course Kolas started writing in the 70s and OMA started designing and building also in the 80s, uh, there is a sort of quite older uh, theoretical tradition in this work of the 70s and the 80s that can be located exactly in the 60s uh, in the work of uh, and in the writings and the ideas of Roland Barthes. So that is the main idea of my contribution today. We will look at three texts from Roland Barthes and then uh, quite uh, brutally, you could say, uh, confront him with uh, some projects or some ideas of uh, OMA and Rem Kolas from one or two uh, decades later. Now the first uh, and one of the most famous texts by Barth uh, was written on the Eiffel Tower in 1964. I think it was a commissioned text and it was published together with photographs uh, in 1964 as a, a separate book. So it's not that long an essay. Um, but as you probably know, the, the uh, Eiffel Tower was uh, constructed in 1889, so uh, one century after 1789, the French Revolution, exactly as a sort of uh, a jubilee or a sort of um, uh, to celebrate the anniversary of the uh, French Revolution. So in this sense, it was constructed as a very, you could say, one-dimensional monument celebrating uh, well, the, the values of uh, modern French society. Now, what Roland Barthes does in, uh, in uh, mid-60s uh, uh, is offering a new way of looking at this Eiffel Tower, but also a new way of looking at the city uh, and the world. And this is a kind of uh, well, fashion he introduces, I mean, over, or a sort of theoretical um, method to look at uh, urban artifacts like the Eiffel Tower, but also to look at the city and the world in general. That is somewhat related to, uh, of course, the what you could call the revolutionary movements of 1968 in Paris. Uh, the moment, uh, or the, uh, yeah, the moment when uh, there was a sort of um, 
critical uh, um, oppo so, so people started opposing the, the authority and uh, sort of institutional uh, power. And this kind of uh, ideas or this kind of uh, societal evolutions is certainly present in everything that uh, Roland Barst writes uh, at, uh, at this time. So what he says is that um, he, he proposes to, to look at the tower as a sort of natural phenomenon. So not, uh, that is already important, I think, so it's not really a sort of cultural uh, thing that has been uh, consciously erected, but it is something that is simply there. And what he proposes to do is to uh, uh, ask questions or to question um, the, the meaning of this tower infinitely, uh, so endlessly. He calls it a sort of pure uh, sign, an empty sign, an almost empty sign. Uh, that wants to say everything. So, and then this is a very famous and I think beautiful uh, metaphor. He says that the Eiffel Tower attracts meaning like uh, a lightning rod uh, attracts lightning. Or, comme un paratonnerre la foudre. And then he says, pour, uh, for, for all, everybody who loves signification or meaning, it plays a sort of prestigious role uh, as a sort of pure, uh, significant. Um, and a sort of uh, form in which people can continuously uh, project meaning. And this is, uh, this is actually, the, you could say, the difference between a very more traditional and uh, non, uh, well, the, the, the sort of a difference with uh, looking at the Eiffel Tower before uh, the world, uh, the Second World War, um, is that it was, as I said, a sort of very clear monument heralding the values of, uh, of the French nation, so liberty, uh, fraternity, and uh, equality. Well, uh, what Roland Barthes says is that we should look at it differently, not as something that has meaning, but that can obtain meaning, and this kind of meaning is simply uh, an individual matter. So it's something that everybody, uh, every single individual citizen, can look at this tower and can uh, project it with all kinds of uh, fantasies and, uh, and ideas. So this is also, uh, so he, he says that uh, to, to realize this kind of thing, the tower is uh, in a way very uh, functional. Although uh, this is something that nowadays is, is, I can imagine, is somewhat forgotten, but this uh, when, when the Eiffel Tower was constructed, there were uh, quite a lot of theories, or actually it had quite a lot of functions. So it was a sort of uh, scientific laboratory for all kinds of meteorological experiments, for example. Um, but of course, Bart says that this function is um, in a way always there, but much important, of, or much more important, is that it is always, it, is that it, it is always a sort of dream or a sort of utopian um, that it always has a utopian dimension, exactly because it allows people, the citizens of Paris or even tourists, to look at this tower and to invest it with all kinds of uh, uh, dream, dreams. So, um, he even goes as far as saying that the tower is not a sort of souvenir of, uh, which it actually was, of course. Uh, that it is not even a, a, a sort of culture, but it is something that can um, immediately consumed by uh, mankind simply by uh, by looking at it or by the, the, the sort of views it offers on uh, Paris uh, in general. This is another important remark. I think that you can easily call a sort of metropolitan uh, condition, or that you can call part of his conception of a metropolitan condition. He says that uh, this, the Eiffel Tower has the function that is essential to all uh, uh, important human, or all important places of uh, mankind. It is uh, l'autarchie, so it has, it is completely, it is in a way a sort of world uh, unto itself. It can uh, live, um, Without having, without other uh, buildings or elements being necessary to uh, sustain this kind of uh, functioning of the tower, 
So one can dream there, one can eat, look, uh, understand, uh, be astonished uh, by things. And then he compares it to a boat, because you are, uh, in a way, cut off of the rest of the world. But at the same time, you are also present together with all other kinds of different boats um, uh, inside of the city. And I think this is, of course, maybe an, an analogy that is maybe too obvious, but um, you can compare this to one of the first projects of OMA, the city of the captive globe, in which you have a sort of metropolitan um, uh, field that consists of uh, kind of enclaves that are completely autonomous, but that are nevertheless, but they are nevertheless part of a sort of larger uh, metropolitan condition. So they don't need one another except as a sort of part of a, a larger uh, collection of uh, buildings. So here he uh, calls the the, um, the tower a sort of metaphor without uh, without end, uh, and it, uh, it exactly allows a sort of freedom towards citizens to uh, exercise this very large and important function of the imaginary. And this is there, he writes, their liberty, because no history whatsoever can uh, take it away from them. So there is a sort of very, uh, you could say, almost anti-political or at least anti-social uh, part in this conception of the metropolis, in the sense that the, the experience of it is completely individualized. So the idea is that, uh, and the tower sort of is a sort of uh, emblematic uh, element in this. The idea is that looking at the tower, every uh, individual inhabitant of the metropolis can uh, have its own meaning without um, needing 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 to take into account uh, other meanings that are invested in it by uh, other citizens. So there is no real collective uh, collective value that is. Um, uh, invested in the, the Eiffel Tower, instead of course that it is collective in the sense that it is completely, that it is a sort of guarantee for individual uh, meaning. Um, now we, of course, we sort of shift immediately to uh, the uh, Villa da Lava, which, um, well, I think you could, the, the what is metropolitan or uh, the sort of metropolitan shift inside of this uh, villa is that it has quite similar uh, characteristics of the Eiffel Tower, but the difference is, of course, that it is a house. So the uh, individuality that is uh, that Barth describes uh, in regards to the Eiffel Tower, so the, the Eiffel Tower is something different for everyone, is here. Um, you could say even more individualized exactly because the, the urban artifact or the, the metropolitan building is no longer a tower but a singular uh, uh, building. So the house is the new monument, although it is of course a very paradoxical monument because it is not a sort of uh, element of a shared condition or a nation state but um, well, a completely uh, individualized um, place. And at the same time, the, 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 uh, what Bart said about the Eiffel Tower being as a sort of autarkic element, I think you can also apply this to this kind of house um, in the sense that it is, it is, well, it does, of course, react to its surroundings, but at the same time, it has no necessity for it in this urban or suburban context, it has no, uh, it is not really independent of uh, what kind of houses uh, are uh, in its immediate surroundings. And then another, uh, I think, point of comparison between the Eiffel Tower is this one, indeed from 1989, so actually, maybe coincidentally, a project that is, uh, that was designed 100 years uh, after the construction of the uh, Eiffel Tower, and well, simply put, you could say that this is designed as a sort of Eiffel Tower for Europe. Um, so, because in the same way it is, um, it is functional, but uh, not representational, but, and this function is also 
well, not very, you could say, substantial, because it's more kind of hub, sort of platform, in which um, different uh, transportation means, in, in which you can s switch from uh, one transportation means, uh, one means of transportation to the other. Um, so I guess you all more or less know the project. It was uh, designed at for Zeebrugge in Belgium as a sort of sea trade center uh, on the Belgian coast, as a sort of ferry terminal to cross the channel towards uh, the United Kingdom. But it immediately, certainly in the, in the hands of COLAS and OMA, it became much more. Um, it became a sort of symbol, uh, but again, just like the Eiffel Tower, sort of empty symbol for Europe because you could certainly at the time project all kinds of, uh, of things um, specific for that moment in European history because it sort of represented the dream of a, a, uni a unified Europe and of a sort of, sort of endless possibility of transportation of both people uh, and, uh, and goods. And again here there is, uh, of course, certainly looking from our uh, point of view, something old-fashioned uh, in this uh, heralding of, um, of transportation, exactly because what is completely absent is the, the airplane. Um, and that was also the reason uh, why it wasn't built, because this ferry company knew that uh, that it didn't have many uh, cents to compete with um, well, uh, cheap airplanes or uh, the, the, the tunnel uh, in between uh, Europe and uh, Great Britain. Um, but at the same time, it did present, I think in 1989, um, a sort of, uh, you could say just like the Eiffel Tower, sort of empty signifier in which all kinds of dreams and expectations for the future uh, could be projected. The second text I would like to discuss is from 1967, so three years later than um, the one on the Eiffel Tower. And uh, it was actually a conference or a, a speech or a lecture that uh, Bart gave at a, a sort of conference um, of urbanists and urban planners, and it was published in 1970 in this issue of L'Architecture um, Toujours which was, I think, quite an interesting, uh, in, as, uh, in its entirety, quite interesting uh, document to look at now, just to see how the, the city at that time, and Paris in particular, because Paris, of course, uh, L'Architecture Toujours being being a French magazine, plays a quite important role. So what kind of ideas there were circulating around what a city or a metropolis could be uh, at the time. Now, and in this, uh, it was in this uh, issue of L'Architecture d'aujourd'hui that um, uh, the, the text by Bart was published. Um, and the title was simply Simiologie et Urbanisme. Um, now, as you all know, Simiologie is a sort of Nowadays, you could consider it as a, as a sort of pseudo-scientific uh, discipline, although at the time it was uh, it was taken for very scientific. It had quite scientific uh, pretensions that uh, uh, considers everything that surrounds us as uh, a possible sign and a sign that can be uh, signs that can be discussed and talked about. It can be interpreted, but signs that never have a clear and definite meaning. And this is, simply put, what uh, Bart projects to the city and what he tries to uh, tell these urban planners at this conference in 1967. So there is no really shared meaning when looking at a city. There is no shared value, no shared interpretations, but all kinds of, all meanings, certainly in a, an urban or metropolitan context, are completely uh, individualized. Um, so then he, he says in the introduction uh, to his lecture, I, uh, I love the city, I love science, and this double love that is probably uh, actually one love, because um, you could say that if you are looking for science, you need the city, 
this double love uh, uh, sort of forces me into believing that there is something like uh, semiotics of the city. So the city is a language, it, it talks to its inhabitants, we talk to the city um, simply by, by living in it, by walking through it, by looking at it. But then, and this is again the, the same shift that is present in his text on the Eiffel Tower, he says that we should not uh, look at the city by using a simple uh, one-dimensional metaphor. So there is no such thing as a city or city elements that can be um, deciphered and that have a sort of uh, locked code um, that is, um, well, that is, that is guaranteed to be there uh, uh, for, for always. So he simply uh, proposes to speak this language of the city without talking in metaphors. And then he refers to Freud saying that uh, Freud was the first one to consider um, the language of dreams, also not by just simply looking at these dreams in a sort of metaphorical sense, but by considering as something that, that is real and that does not necessarily, is simply there just to represent uh, something. So you can never uh, lock uh, what, whatever kind of element inside of a city in, an, uh, in a full signification, in an uh, ultimate meaning. And this is the next step, and this is of course one of the cliches of the, the theoretical thinking of that time, is that when you read something, you can read the city, and this reading is also a kind of writing, exactly because it is a sort of uh, constant intellectual activity that engages you not only to read, but to, to sort of by interpreting and by reading by writing a kind of uh, text uh, yourself. And as such, the city is a, a form of writing, and um, whoever moves to the city is reading this uh, city, um, taking fragments of what is being said, and then that is quite important, I think, pour les actualiser en secret. So you have to sort of, you, all these fra city fragments come to you, but then you have to uh, renew them and act, make them actual and uh, more contemporary or make them your own. But this has to be done, according to Bart, en secret. So this is again, I think, a sense that the metropolis of this, or, or this uh, definition of the metropolitan condition is a very individual matter, uh, something that, that we all do quite, uh, you could say, in quite a, a lonely uh, state in the sense that it's <coughs> not shared or not explicitly shared uh, with others. It is something that we do in secret simply by walking around in the uh, public uh, domain. Then he goes even further uh, with another sort of uh, idée reçue of this era by calling uh, this, this kind of individual enjoyment of uh, metropolitan um, um, areas as uh, erotic. So, um, the, the, er the eroticism of the city is, he says, a sort of uh, reading we can uh, draw from the, the infinite uh, metaphorical nature of the urban discourse. So this is, because there's an erotic activity exactly because it is individual, because it, is, um, it has to do with a sort of uh, watching at uh, other uh, citizens or urbanites, but also watching it, uh, urban and metropolitan elements, and constantly trying to uh, have a sort of individual enjoyment because you are interpreting and because you are reading and because you are playing with these kind of uh, metropolitan elements. And uh, in order to do this, in order to, to obtain this uh, erotic dimension of the city, it is again important uh, Barth writes that we have to go beyond uh, the large institutions or the, the what he calls the grande catégorie, but we have to look into a more um, uh, well more everyday kind of content. So uh, what he calls the grande habitude de l'homme. So for example, uh, food uh, and then also uh, shopping. So this is a sort of you could say already uh, at the end of the 60s sort of. Uh, plea to uh, regard shopping as an, an enjoyable, almost erotic uh, condition that of course, I don't need to tell you that 
Kovlas started explicitly working on in the 90s. We have to uh, try to understand this game of uh, science that is the city, um, and that, and also understand that each city is a is a structure. But we we should never try to uh, to fill it uh, completely and uh, and uh, forever. <coughs> now I think uh, a project that can be put next to this is the the project from 1983, indeed for Paris, uh, for Parc de la Ville. That had the the the, uh, the project description had as a. And the title of the project description was Congestion Without Matter. And I think that is, you could say that is exactly what Bart writes about when he says that um, the city is a structure that you can uh, fill, but you can never sort of fill it completely and you can never turn it into an, uh, you can never give it a definite uh, form. So this is why this kind of, uh, the method that is introduced here of doing metropolitan urban planning is by, uh, you could say, building by means of uh, activities rather than uh, by means of uh, architecture. So it is a sort of um, enormous and in a way absurd um, stacking of uh, all kinds of leisurely urban uh, activities that nevertheless creates a sort of clear image but that it is that is not a sort of stable or uh, you could say architectural image in the traditional sense. And then uh, the last text is, uh, well, coincidentally or not, uh, dealing with Japan and uh, Tokyo. This was written in 1970, and actually there are elements of this book uh, by Roland Barthes that are already present in the lecture of 1967, so he was already preparing this uh, study or this uh, essayistic um, book. And again, this is for this era, uh, or for, you could say, post-war cultural production in general, uh, not that extremely original, or you could say that Bart was one of the first uh, to do so. This is simply the fact that um, uh, Western intellectuals in their, in, for the sort of complete or the real fulfillment of their uh, intellectual ideas and theories, they decide to leave Europe and uh, the Occident, Occidental uh, area and they decide to go east to uh, Japan or to uh, China to sort of, um, well, to sort of test their ideas uh, and to, again, confront um, more European conditions with the sort of almost realized utopian uh, conditions of, uh, in this case, Tokyo uh, or Japan. So actually everything that he has been, uh, um, that Bart has been propagating during the 60s uh, as the, the more important things we should uh, think about or look at uh, in, in Western Europe, he finds already uh, present in uh, Japan and in Tokyo. That is why he also calls uh, the country in general a sort of empire of science, exactly because it is one, you could say, one large, uh, for him at least, one large uh, erotic play field of things that are waiting to be interpreted and to be uh, enjoyed uh, by him. Again, um, completely in a sort of, uh, well, in a sort of completely isolated or at least lonely state because there is, he does not speak uh, the Japanese language. So you can see this clearly in this book. He, he has no real contact. Uh, he doesn't talk with, um, with any of the, the inhabitants of Tokyo or Japan, but at the same time he is completely uh, intellectually thinking and reading everything that uh, goes on around him. This is uh, written on the book cover, uh, written by Bart himself. So he says, uh, again, what he was writing about uh, when he gave the lecture on, um, on uh, urbanism and semiology, but also when he uh, proposed his uh, new interpretation of the Eiffel Tower, is that uh, we have to look for signs, not in sort of institutional domains, so we don't have to occupy or we don't have to uh, 
look for art or folklore or not even civilization, but we have to look to the city, to the, the, the magazine, so, so the, the store, shops, to the theater, to uh, politeness, so in a sort of uh, direct, um, very formal uh, contact between people, to gardens and to violence. And this is, again, the sort of erotic thing that he is uh, looking for inside of uh, this confrontation. So he says it, it uh, causes a certain ébranlement, which is sort of, uh, sort of shaking and undermining a concussion of uh, the personal subject, sort of reversal of old lectures and um, uh, so you are constantly uh, or he is constantly uh, confronted with uh, sort of meanings that uh, challenge everything he knows. Um, exactly because, uh, and this is another important element, exactly because there is a sort of uh, emptiness inside of these uh, signs. So an emptiness that constantly asks to be filled or interpreted without knowing that you can uh, fill it uh, completely uh, and uh, forever. So this is. That is what he calls everything that he sees or everything that he is confronted with as a sort of emptiness. But this emptiness is there without that the object ever becomes uh, non-significant. And the object always remains something that he wants and that he wants to look at and that he wants to uh, uh, have contact with. Um, this is a large uh, quote about uh, the Japanese uh, train station um, in which he uh, actually, so the second part, or um, actually in the half of the quotation, the important uh, elements enter because he says that the Japanese station is actually uh, traversed by a thousand uh, functional trajectories. Um, so you not only are not only there in the station to travel or to, but also to buy things, to buy clothes, to buy food. And then he says that when a train uh, gets off the tracks, it, it probably ends up in a sort of rayon de chaussures, in a sort of uh, uh, clothing shop. Um, and what he says, and this is, you could simply say, a sort of uh, shift from high culture to low culture. What he says is that uh, the station is no longer this has no longer this sacred character, um, and which separates it from the the, the old uh, landmarks of, of the traditional city, so cathedrals, churches, uh, city houses, and historical monuments. And this is, as as we've seen, the, the same uh, operation that he um, sort of, um, he said the same thing about the Eiffel Tower in the sense that he proposed to no longer read it as an historical monument but as a very everyday, uh, almost banal uh, object that is, because of its banality, uh, extremely uh, enjoyable. This is another thing he says about Tokyo, uh, the important or one of the uh, attractive things is that uh, in opposition to uh, cities in Western Europe, is that the, these cities are uh, a lot of the times concentric, uh, so they are made up out of circles with the same midpoint. And this midpoint, he says, is always full of things. So it's, uh, it's full of uh, uh, the values of civilization. So in the center you have a church, you have uh, offices, you have uh, banks, uh, you have uh, shops, you have uh, um, uh, city squares or cafes. So when you go into the center of a, a, a classic um, Western city, you sort of are confronted with the, the social truth, with the things that uh, the society thinks as important uh, at that moment. Um, and what he then discovers in Tokyo is that um, that it also has a center, but the center is completely empty. So there is a drawing of Tokyo inside of the book, um, which is, I think it, this is of course this uh, empty center, which is the uh, Imperial Palace, uh, 
and the residence of the uh, Emperor of Japan. And it is exactly because this center is empty that it is again a sort of, uh, you could say, empty projection screen for the, the fantasies that you can, uh, as an individual, fantasize about this, uh, about what is taking place in this uh, city center forever, in opposition so to the more classical, old-fashioned center of uh, Western cities that are, instead of empty, completely full, and there is no possibility to for the individual citizen to, to have sort of fantasies or erotic uh, enjoyments of this uh, city center because the meaning is, uh, is already fixed. So this is a, a, an obsession that is uh, especially in this book but that is also present in a lot of other writings of Roland Barthes. This is an obsession with emptiness, uh, with the void. Um, this is the, uh, if I'm correct, the Japanese sign for uh, uh, emptiness. It is, and what what is what attracts him in this kind of sign is is that there is a sort of sign for emptiness. So actually, this is the the, the written uh, sign that actually um, expresses the fact that something that there is actually nothing there. Uh, and of course, this is uh, very easily. This can e very easily be compared with uh, Mila Senar, the project from OMA from 1978, which was the project text was entitled "Imagining Nothingness." So it is the same uh, sort of uh, graphic element that is. You have a sort of uh, image that is actually an image of something that is not there because it is based on the, uh, the imagining of nothingness. And again, compared to the uh, project for uh, uh, Paris de la Villette, it is again a matter of not building. So, uh, as you probably know this project, the, instead of building a Ville Nouvelle uh, in the vicinity of Paris, OMA decided to uh, sort of freeze the empty to collect and to freeze the empty spots inside of, uh, or that were already there, and to simply let this uh, development of the Ville Nouvelle take place. But to, the, the, only, uh, the only thing that you could say the urban planner did was um, uh, to keep this, uh, the beauty and this, which, which is what uh, Colas literally writes, uh, this freedom of this kind of emptiness that uh, can be, uh, that can remain. Now I end uh, this sort of, uh, I could say, montage of uh, Roland Barthes and OMA by one a quote from Colas himself. I think it's from some years ago when he was asked to, uh, by a, a magazine, to present his, um, his favorite books. And he said, uh, well, simply put, that uh, The Empire of Science by Roland Barthes made him absolutely devastating impression on me um, exactly because it shows there is no distinction um, between significant and insignificant content and that we should take note of and decipher our signs and this was a kind of you could say sort of shift to low culture or to uh, at least elements that are not inside of the institutionally organized uh, elements or domains of high culture that enabled him to, to look at New York, a city that was at the time, uh, certainly from a European perspective, uh, rather uh, uninteresting. Now there are a lot of things you could say about this quote. Uh, for example, that there were uh, certainly also more architectural predecessors in turning to uh, turning to, uh, uh, to phenomena that held uh, extraordinary little prestige. Of course, uh, learning from Las Vegas was uh, earlier than uh, uh, delirious New York. But um, maybe more important is that, uh, and this is not present in this quote, is that what, what you could say that uh, Colas learned from Roland Barthes is that the metropolis is not uh, the city. So it is not the... Uh, traditional city as a sort of place in which there are a lot of shared and common values. 
But on the contrary, the, the metropolis is a sort of place where the individual freedom uh, is the most important. Individual freedom to read and to define all by yourself uh, what is uh, meaningful uh, and important. Um, I would like to end with uh, maybe a more provocative uh, quote from a more contemporary text by Kohlhaas, which well, simply put, you can uh, ask yourself if this, uh, this is something I think all of you should ask yourself. Whether this metropolitan project, whether it was defined by Bart or by Kohlhaas, is today uh, well, still valuable, or is it, which is another question, if it is uh, still possible. So this idea that uh, instead of being part of a collective, the a metropolitanite can, uh, in a way, serve the waves of the uh, metropolis, which can, I think, also be interpreted as a sort of, in the, the sense that Roland Barthes, Barthes gives to it, as a sort of uh, endless erotic reading of uh, the city science without giving things an, uh, a fixed meaning. You can wonder if this kind of uh, activity is still something that uh, our uh, contemporary cities uh, offer, and whether there is still something um, well, critical or uh, or um, liberating about uh, this uh, conception of the metropolis or this replacement of uh, the city by the metropolis. And there are certainly a lot of elements in junk in junk space written in 2001, which. <laughs> from which you can uh, sort of decide that Kolas himself seriously doubts uh, this kind of value of the metropolitan condition or this shift, you could say, from city to metropolis that he uh, himself, uh, well, that was actually the, the, the sort of impetus behind the entire uh, project of uh, Owen May. So to, to give only one example in junk space, he writes, that narrative reflexes that have enabled us from the beginning of time to connect dots, fill in blanks, so sort of interpret voids, you could say, they are now turned against us. We cannot stop noticing that no sequence is too <coughs> absurd, trivial, meaningless, insulting. So um, we helplessly register, provide insight, squeeze meaning, read intention. We cannot stop making sense out of the utterly senseless. This is uh, a sort of, you could say, a sort of negative uh, uh, counter side to uh, to the, 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 the reading of the metropolis that was uh, offered by uh, Roland Barthes. So you could interpret this as Kola saying that this sort of free erotic reading um, is no longer uh, possible because every meaning that you can find inside of a metropolitan condition is completely turned back at you as absurd, trivial, meaningless, uh, and even insulting. So the real pleasure of uh, enjoying the metropolis is um, well, no longer there. Uh, that was uh, sort of the things I would I hoped to confront you with. <coughs> Thank you, Christophe. I think we don't need a microphone for this for a conversation. Um, maybe a few questions, and I would like to start the questions by asking one. Um, of course, you got, uh, we asked you to deal with the metropolis, uh, the studio. Uh, you brought in Bart, Bart Polas, Polas, Office for Metropolitan Architecture, the Metropolis 89, and so forth. Uh, now, to what extent is Bart dealing with the metropolis? In other words, uh, what is the metropolis? Because uh, we notice he's writing about the city, the city science, uh, this projection of meaning, this, in a way, individual experience of meaning, this empty core. Indeed, all points which you'll see back in the of the way of that time, and I think that argument is, is extremely clear and visible, and I think very interesting for us. At the same time, what makes this argument an argument about the metropolis. What is metropolitan about this? Well, uh, 
it's it's more I think it's more directed at you as a sort of question or as an intuition. But I wonder exactly if this, uh, as I said, this shift that Bart uh, theorized and that Colas took over from defining the city as a sort of place in which uh, there is a sort of collective uh, investment of values and meanings to a more individualized field of science. If that is exactly not sort of, if you cannot define it as a sort of shift from an urban condition to a metropolitan condition. Um, of course, this is, if this is the case, this is of course a sort of, uh, probably very European uh, metropolitan condition that is not, uh, that is different paradoxically from the one from, for example, New York. I think you could say that uh, maybe the way in which Colas looked at New York when writing Delirious New York was exactly a sort of very, uh, this kind of structuralist, post-structuralist method of uh, Bart uh, while looking at an American city. Um, but I wonder, and this is so more directed to this sort of question, if it is possible exactly to define the metropolis as a sort of uh, new kind of a city form in which the city is no longer a sort of uh, place for uh, shared and collective uh, national, if you want, uh, values and meanings, but more a sort of completely individualized uh, uh, area in which we all are uh, completely individualized uh, uh, metropolitanites that enjoy uh, city science without giving them um, uh, Fixed mean. At the same time, that, uh, if I can just one more time connect to that, you also talk about, say, one meaning becoming multiple means projected on one object, for example, the Apple Tower, um, one center becoming either the empty center or the multiple center, because I think Tokyo you can interpret in both ways to some extent. So, you see somehow an association or connection with. For me, working in the 80s, 90s, and not only then, on many projects related to infrastructure. Uh, so many projects related to, in a way, a very different kind of form uh, like uh, idea of multiple centers. I mean, we deal with, you know, there's different, uh, very specific spots where there's no one center but many centers. Is perhaps this whole metropolitan projection you refer to also not very much of that time exactly because, especially in Europe, we're talking about, there's all of a sudden this argument of uh, building around infrastructure rather than building around what was considered the traditional city center. Mm -hmm. no, I think that, I don't know if that answer your, answers your question, but one of the uh, things that probably attracted or that makes, it, in a more general sense, uh, infrastructure very attractive is that it is uh, functional, but at the same time it is also sort of, uh, it is also non-functional because it doesn't have a function in itself. Infrastructure is what you do to, uh, or a train station is a sort of place in which you don't stay, but you simply use it to go to another function, and a probably more important function. So, um, this is, uh, Probably also what attracts uh, Roland Bart in the, the train station of uh, Tokyo is exactly this way in which it is a uh, more collection of all kinds of uh, quite fleeting activities um, without uh, being a sort of uh, architectural element that has a, well, a, a, a sort of valuable function uh, in itself. But it is true, I guess, that um, certainly in the 80s and the 90s, this sort of uh, stress on infrastructural projects uh, was quite important. And this probably also has to do with a sort of idea that uh, uh, connecting uh, different elements of Europe became much more important. So sort of global uh, transportation, well, not global, but European uh, 
transportation, sort of unification of uh, Europe? No, but I'm asking because mm -hmm. it's very different from the car individual. I mean, you talk about Las Vegas very shortly, mm -hmm. um, and then you realize, okay, that kind of individual reading of science has to do with individual car, individual transport and board, but that individual in Tokyo and Europe, the OMA kind of individual, let's say, is the individual in, in the mass. So it's always the individual who is an enormous group of people. Which is a very peculiar one. Yeah. No, it's true. There is a sort of, it's a sort of collective individualness, which is. Uh, yeah, there's also this this famous quote from uh, Colas, in which he says that the only, I don't know, I think it's in the, the text on generic city, or bigness, that the only uh, function left for uh, architecture is to sort of. Uh, reply to the ongoing or the continuous desire for collectivity that mankind has. And I think that these projects, certainly these infrastructural projects, uh, have that in common, but it is a sort of paradoxical collectivity, but it's, it's not the kind of collectivity that you have, for example, in a church where everybody is silent and concentrated for uh, quite some time, but it is a sort of uh, individual collectivity. Exactly in the lecture with the director Eiffel, which is something that was a beam for something else, and then came to have uh, other meanings. You know? and, uh, and then it passed through uh, uh, my name, so Colas. So uh, there is clearly an intention to build something which works like the director. So I find uh, an interesting intention and almost a possible failure in that passage among the something that society and something that uh, has been here in the United States, it's not a clear question, but it's uh, an interesting key. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's, that also has to do with the tension between nature and culture. So the uh, Roland Barthes says that the Eiffel Tower is something that is simply there and that it's not important if it's designed, it's just part of the city. And you could say that in the sort of design strategy of OMA and COAS that, that may be, uh, you can call metropolitan, is that in a lot of their uh, projects, the, there's always the intention of making something that is not designed by themselves. So for example, this, uh, the, the Sea Trade Center, there are there's an enormous amount um, of, of references uh, um, by, made by OMA, but also by uh, critics and, uh, and historians, saying that uh, well, this was actually a, a sort of this the Sea Trade Center was an objet trouvé, so it was not something that uh, it was simply taken from history or from. Uh, sort of popular culture in general, and then they turned it into a building. So, uh, for example, the, I showed the, the, the painting of the, uh, the Tower of Babel, the painting by Brugge. Um, but there are also theories saying that, it's, uh, that this building is actually, if you take a look at the site plan of Seebrugge, it, it has the, the same shape as um, as the, the, the building of the uh, Sea Trade Center. So I think it's true that when, uh, if you compare it to Roland Barthes, who sort of rediscovered uh, the Eiffel Tower, there is also this uh, activity of rediscovering in the work of OMA by taking uh, things from simply from culture uh, uh, in general and then by turning them into a sort of architectural project, which is also which is, can also be applied, for example, to uh, Milan Sonar, which is also, which is simply what was there. The, so the design was a sort of a freezing of what was there, and then Colas called it a Chinese ideogram. Mm -hmm. Well, it was probably more correct to call it Japanese. So indeed, there is the... Um, I think it's true that there is this, this idea that architecture is not new, but is simply something that you take from what is already there. And that is indeed the same operation as uh, Bart did with uh, the Eiffel Tower. I have a quite naive question, because you know, if you consider the, for a moment, no, simplifying a lot, the modernist dream as the idea that you build the 
a shared, you know, something which is shared through technology and ideology. And then if you consider that in a way this dream, as you were saying, is replaced during the 60s and then later by individualism or the acceptance now that that dream was, was broken somehow. No? Where are we now? Because, and, and to a certain extent, where is scholars? Because you might argue that in the last 15 years, uh, a lot of people you know, have been trying again this sort of ideology of the common ground, whatever that means. And it's, it's in parallel to that. Uh, it's even true that uh, after having done or having tried in the 90s to do these gigantic projects in, uh, in, uh, in Europe, no? OMA has turned to Far East and other other territories, no? and then coming back in recent years to Europe with small projects, mainly on the cultural field and, uh, and this sort of stuff. No? So I'm, I'm curious to understand, uh, to, to listen to you, what you think about this sort of trajectory, which is again both collective and individual. <laughs> Yeah, well, I think, and that's also maybe a naive answer, um, there is, you could simply say that this strategy of, uh, of OMA or Roland, of, or, or Roland Basque from the 60s and the 70s and the 80s had a sort of new uh, liberating and exciting effect. And uh, this is no longer the case. So simply because you could say, that uh, these mechanisms are, uh, are omnipresent and uh, maybe instrumentalized. So they are, uh, I mean, the idea that uh, the discovery or the in itself, in, in itself critical discovery that shopping can be fun, um, I think, well, this is something that a lot of people still agree on this, but this is no longer something that has a sort of critical value when you approach uh, uh, an, a European city. So this has become so completely uh, industrialized, that there is no longer any liberty uh, inside of these convictions. While uh, I think when Bast and, and Kola started writing and working, there was really a sort of escape from more traditional and suffocating and uh, outworn uh, um, traditions to, to focus on that kind of element. Well, nowadays, you could say that the opposite is true, that uh, what is really suffocating is this idea that uh, shopping is fun, to, to summarize it uh, very briefly. But something which was somehow left in the equation, I mean, uh, you don't see it very much in the work of Ole uh, Maybe there's no clear indicator there in parts writing, or at least the parts you, you show us today. But somehow it was very present, say, in the late 80s or the 90s, at least for a little while. And it seems crucial also, by the way, also for our studio. Uh, in relationship to your story of the individual, is housing. So why are you with housing? In the sense that if you, if you understand whether it's now an old idea or a new idea, the metropolis is what we are still dealing with, or is it the dream of the metropolis? Uh, I have to think of, of the fact that while Kolas, uh, together of course with Kolov, came from Uber's world in some sense, and then perhaps would, even though already influenced by that around that time, I wouldn't be surprised, you can see some of these elements of the Uber's work. You see in Kolas' work on, on York, Housing is there. I mean, in the sense that I mean, the buildings are also housing. In Kolov's work of, let's say, the late 80s, we see some of these buildings which try to combine some of the things you bring up with housing. And then, of course, you have that, that famous you know, disconnect. Kolov, uh, of the work of, let's say, the late 90s, being extremely conservative, perhaps reconstructing the city, even the old city, so walking away from from um, some of the thoughts of, of, of metropolitan, uh, the metropolitan thinking of the city. And Kola's in a way never really re-engaging into housing whatsoever. So so there we are today and we, we ask ourselves. So I, I was wondering, can you can you do you have thoughts on that? Uh, the individual housing in the metropolis? 
Well, in a way, you could say it's really the, the sort of blank spot of uh, metropolitan condition. I think, for example, that someone like, I don't know everything uh, that Roland Barthes has written, of course, but I think that indeed this, this idea of, uh, of housing or of a domestic uh, situation is indeed somewhat uh, absent inside of this oeuvre because it is a sort of, uh, he's really obsessed with uh, culture, whether it is high or low culture, and it seems that, uh, well, housing is not something that is, uh, well, housing maybe in a way is sort of suppressed by culture because even when you are inside of your own uh, dwelling environment, you're simply consuming culture. So. Uh, there is, in a way, you could say, in, in this kind of metropolitan condition, there is no uh, real difference, or uh, housing or dwelling does not really uh, make a difference. So I think you could uh, apply that to, for example, the Villa da Lava, which is, as I sort of suggested, uh, constructed in the same uh, textual uh, or reading or offered as a, in the same way as a sort of text of pleasure, uh, text for uh, reading pleasure, just like any other building. But at the same time, there's probably, uh, you, know, you could say maybe there is a sort of element in housing that is simply uh, opposed to metropolitan or even in general modern uh, conditions. So housing is so old fashioned and so traditional that it is that there is always something that sort of uh, opposes this uh, this idea. Any question from the audience? Let's see. Thank you very much.